Howdy, friends. This is Annie Fonte, and you are listening to the Badass Soul Seeking Warrior podcast. On each episode, I chat with a different guest and ask them to share their stories about what they were doing before they decided to redesign their life, what they're doing now, and how they navigated through the challenges and events in their life to get to where they are today. What realizations and transformations did they experience? What fears did they overcome? And ultimately, how did they create a life that they love? Okay, all you badass soul-seeking warrior listeners out there, I'm really excited about the conversation we're going to have today with Terry Tucker. Terry has a lot of interesting things to share with us today, and let me tell you a little bit about him, and then we'll get started in this conversation. So Terry has played against Michael Jordan. He's also been a NCAA college basketball player. He's a Citadel, He was a Citadel candidate. He's been a marketing executive, a hospital administrator, a police officer, which included undercover, uh, undercover narcotics investigation and part of the SWAT team for hostage negotiation. He was a women's basketball coach, a business owner, a motivational speaker, an author, and a cancer warrior. Terry, thank you so much for carving time out to visit with us today. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Annie. I'm looking forward to talking to you. Okay, we've got a lot of bases to cover here, just with that introduction to start with. So I'm curious, um, for our audience out there, I'm sure they're just as curious as I am, what was it like playing against Michael Jordan? And was he, is it good as he ended up being back then when you were playing against him? No, it, it was <laughs> actually his freshman year in college at North Carolina and my senior year in college at the Citadel. And every year they used to hold this tournament called the North-South Doubleheader. And they took two teams from North Carolina, which happened to be North Carolina and North Carolina State, and two teams from South Carolina, which happened to be the Citadel and Furman. So much Division I schools, but much smaller schools. And we played around Robin Friday and Saturday night. So this was 1982, Jordan's freshman year. The, the good thing about it for me was his team, North Carolina, won the national championship that mm -hmm. year. And then the following night, I got to play against North Carolina State and Jim Balvano, who the following year, 1983, they won the national championship. So in the course of a weekend, I got to play against two national championship teams. Well, you were soaring with the Eagles way back when. I was, I'll tell you, and, and I didn't even know it, you know. <laughs> exactly. It's interesting how it played out for sure. Okay, now I'm really interested in knowing about your work as a police officer and um, undercover narcotics, et cetera, because that's not certainly for the lighthearted. But most interested in understanding as a hostage negotiator, and I'm sure you went through a tremendous amount of training to do that. What are some of the important steps that you were trained to take and that you then used in your time as a negotiator to get to your desired outcome? Because you're trying to talk people off the ledge in most of these cases, I'm guessing. Yeah, I mean, if you're talking to me, you're probably having the, the worst day of your life. Um, you know, and a lot of times when I talk about this, people have seen the movie, I, I believe it was it was back in the 90s, uh, called The Negotiator, where Samuel L. Jackson plays this hostage negotiator. And people always are like, is that the way it is? No, that's not the way it is. So <laughs> basically, the way it works is there's somebody negotiating, and then there's somebody sitting right next to him who's listening, who is writing you notes, you know. And then there's another group of people who's kind of working the crowd. Maybe, you know, if there's a guy barricaded talking to his mother, you know, what's happening, what's going on? You know, well, he had a fight with me earlier. So as a negotiator, you'll get a note to say, you know, don't talk about his mother because that's the reason he's in this. So it's really a group kind of effort. And I'll never forget when I, when I finally got chosen for the team, you know, they kind of, we, the way we trained is with scenarios. We, we did different scenarios and, and we had a psychologist that worked with us and things like that. And, you know, I, there, there's a barricaded person. I'm talking through a door. There's a hostage. The hostage is yelling the whole time. And I spent most of the negotiation talking to the hostage, you know, and which is, and this sounds really bad, but you really kind of try to negate the hostage and you just focus on 
the hostage taker and why we're in this. And, you know, you try to build trust. And that was a, that was a huge part of being a negotiator was, was the trust factor. We never lied to anybody. I mean, we would get people who would say, you know, I'll put the gun down and I'll come out, but you got to promise me I'm not going to go to jail. Yeah. It's like, well, when you come out, you are going to go to jail, but hey, let's talk. And then you would try to deflect it to something more positive because, you know, there was, there were several people that, we talked to them one year, and then two years later, we're right back talking to them again, and we never wanted them to be able to say, you know what, you lied to me, because once that happens, that trust factor is gone, and, and there's no way you're going to have a successful outcome. But about 90% of the time, we did. We, we got either the person out or the hostage out and the person out successfully, but there was about 10% of the time where I never lost the hostage, but there were several times where the, the hostage taker or the barricaded person decided to end their life. And it was a shame. But but as you say, you know, I'm trying to deal with a problem that very well may have started, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Yeah. And I'm going to solve it in, you know, even four or five hours. Yeah. That, that's just not realistic. Right. True. Well, I bet that was a very um, educational part of your vast career here. Oh, it was. It, it was a great time. I worked with great people. And, you know, I mean, I, I, I'll tell you a quick story. There was a time we were negotiating with a 15-year-old kid okay. and everything that we were trained to do wasn't working. So we kind of took a little time out. We kind of put our heads together. and We were like, he's 15. Let's scare him. I mean, we tried everything else. Like, let's scare him. And literally, we broke a window. We did, and the tactical team did, broke a window, threw in a, a flashbang grenade and it's not a grenade in the sense that doesn't explode, but what it does is it gives off a real bright light and a, and a very loud noise. And we did that. And literally within 10 minutes, he was out, you know? So, I mean, sometimes you've, you've got to break the mold and try something different. It was like, well, let's scare him. Let's try to be a parent to him. And that worked. Well, and I think a lot of those skills that you gained in doing that have probably been useful throughout your life from that point forward. Yeah, they have. You know, as a, as a police officer, most of your interaction with people is face to face. You know, you, you stop somebody for speeding or, you know, you go on a radio run for a domestic run and, and you're dealing with people face to face. I can see you. You can see me. And, and, and you learn to take visual clues away from that. You know, if somebody's, you know, you're talking to them and they're kind of looking around, you're like, well, maybe they're looking to escape or to run and or, you know, somebody's balling up their fists. Maybe they're going to want to fight you. And you can do something about that. You know, you can you can sit them down, you can handcuff them, you can put them in your car, you can do whatever is appropriate for why you're there. But as a negotiator, the person wasn't there. They weren't with us. A lot of times we were, you know, a block or two away talking over a phone. So we had to figure things out based on what people were saying, what they weren't saying, and how they were saying it. And there were several times where you know, we're talking with somebody and, you know, we're kind of over here and we're spending two hours talking about all this stuff when the real problem is over here and we haven't even touched that yet, but they need to burn off some of this energy over here before we can get over there and start talking about why we're really there. Yeah. Fascinating, fascinating stuff for sure. Well, now I want to move on because in 2012, you were dealt a pretty rough hand of cards. You were diagnosed with acral lithogenous melanoma, which is a very rare cancer. I don't know that I pronounced that correctly, but I, I took a shot at it. And um, you have dealt with that ever since. So I want to start with when you were given that diagnosis. It's my understanding this whole thing started out with a little bit of a callus-like feature on the bottom of your foot. And you were a basketball coach at the time. And you went to your doctor and that's kind of how this started. He took an x-ray and things kind of kind of went downhill a bit from there. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, you're right. I, I was a basketball coach and, and I had a callus break open right below my third toe. And being a coach, you're on your feet a lot. So I didn't think about it uh, all that much until a couple of weeks later, it, it still hadn't healed. So I went to see a podiatrist, a foot doctor friend of mine. And he took an x-ray. He's like, Terry, I think you have a little cyst in there and I can cut it out. And he did. And he showed it to me, just a little gelatin sack with some white fat in it. No blood, no dark spots, nothing that would give anybody any kind of concern or pause. But he sent it off to pathology. And then two weeks later, he calls me 
And as I said, he was a friend. So the more difficulty he was having describing what was going on, the more frightened I was becoming. And so finally, he just, he just laid it out. He said, Terry, I've been a doctor for 25 years. I have never seen this form of cancer. You have a rare form of melanoma that appears on the bottom of the feet or the palms of the hands. And I'd recommend you go to MD Anderson, which is probably one of the better cancer hospitals in the United States, if not the world, and, and be treated there because your cancer is so rare. So that started my nine-year saga of dealing with this disease. And when, mm. when he told you this news, it's, it's not news any of us would ever want to receive, but I'm sure you went through various emotions. What was that like for you? And how did you kind of land back on your feet so you could start this nine-year journey you've been on so far? Yeah, I, you know, when my, my dad was diagnosed with cancer right after I graduated from college, and he was of a generation where men didn't traditionally go to the doctor. And when he was diagnosed with breast cancer, he was literally in stage four. I mean, they, they didn't know what to do with a man with breast cancer back in the 1980s. I mean, they tried some things, but they pretty much sent him home to die. And, and I made a decision then in my life. I'm like, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do, and I had pretty much lived a quote unquote clean life, but I made the decision. I'm going to see a doctor for a physical every year. I'm going to do whatever he or she recommends in terms of testing. And I, I did all that. You know, I never abused alcohol and drugs. I never smoked. You know, I exercised. I, I did everything that we're told to do to stay healthy. And yet here I am with this diagnosis. So you're right. I mean, I was, I was mad. I was, you know, depressed. I, I, you know, I, I, my, my emotions ran the gambit until finally it was just like, well, these are the cards that I've been dealt. And, you know, I have two choices. I can feel sorry for myself or I can play these cards to the best of my ability. And I chose to do the latter. Um, you know, my, our daughter was 15 years old at the time. And my wife and I made a conscious decision. It's like, you know what? We're not going to lie to her. We're going to tell her the truth. Obviously, what was age appropriate? She's an adult now. So, I mean, we, we talked to her very openly about what's going on. But it, it was just something that I realized, you know, I can complain and, and you know, get upset. It's not going to do me any good. You know, these are the cards I've been dealt. I got to play these cards. Yeah. And as part of the treatment you went through, you were receiving for almost five years, weekly injections of interferon. And as a result of that, you suffered pretty severe flu-like symptoms for almost the entirety of that almost five years. Is that correct? What was that like and how did you handle that part of it? Yeah, that was, I, I, I'll never forget my oncologist suggesting that. And I didn't really know a lot about interferon. Um, but again, I, I was coaching basketball and it just so happened that one of the grandmothers of one of my players was on interferon for, uh, she had hepatitis in, in, in her liver. And so I, I talked to her about it before I even made the, the decision. And she was like, you know, yeah, it's kind of hard, but you know, I'm only on it for like, you know, eight months tops to a year. And I thought, you know, yeah, okay. I mean, if, if, if one of my players' grandmothers can do it, I, I, I can do it. So I remember kind of going into my oncologist, you know, with my chest out, like, you know what? I, I, I think I can do this probably for a year or so. And she kind of looked at me and she's like, you think you could do it for five? I said, wait a minute. You want me to have flu-like symptoms every week for five years? And she's like, well, in theory, yes, but I'll take as long as you can possibly do it. And I, and I looked at her and I thought, that's just stupid. That's just something beyond the realm of what's what any human being should be even asked to do. I, that's just, that's just crazy. And yet I ended up, you know, again, it was like, let's take it a day at a time and let's see how it goes. There were several gradations where they, okay, this is a little too toxic. We're going to have to break it, move it back a little bit and take a little less and a little less and a little less. And eventually it got to the point where it was so toxic to my body that I ended up in the intensive care unit with a fever of 108 degrees because of the toxicity. And obviously they couldn't give it to me anymore, but I made it to four years and seven months on, on that drug. And it was, it was just nasty. I, I don't know how else to describe it. It's just a nasty drug that did nasty things. Yeah. And is it, 
is it seems like that is a long time. Is it because of the type of cancer you had or, or have, or why was it that five year, almost five year time period? Well, part of it was, as my oncologist used to say, we're just trying to kick the can down the road because at the time there were not a lot of treatments for people with melanoma. And so it was like, well, one, we're going to try to kick the can down the road. And two, it was MD Anderson's kind of standard of care at the time. And I was on the drug for a year and then our family moved to Denver. And I was in a, in a way sort of lucky because my oncologist at MD Anderson had done a residency at, at the University of Colorado here in Denver and was literally able to hand me off to one of her colleagues that she knew. And when I got here, you know, I'd been on it for a little over a year and the disease hadn't come back. So I was, you know, kind of relying on it. Like, well, I guess, it, I guess it's working. Well, my oncologist here didn't believe in it. So we kind of, there were several times where we had conversations where he's like, you, you just need to get off this. It, it's too, it's too toxic. It, it just doesn't allow you to have any kind of quality of life. And he was right, but I'm pretty stubborn and I felt it was working. So I just stayed on it. So you were in remission for a bit from the cancer? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you there. You were, you were in remission for a bit of time then? I, I was, I don't know if the word was remission. I mean, I, I had, uh, every six months I had a PET scan to make sure that it, it had not come back. They, they never said, you know, they never called it remission or anything like that. They were just, they knew it was going to come back. They just were you know, let's see how much time we can buy and see what kind of therapies we have when it does come back. And it did in 2017. Then what happened? Yeah, yeah pretty much almost uh, right after the, the interferon was stopped, came back again in the same place on the bottom of my foot. Uh, we tried uh, some biologic medications that did nothing to the cancer, but were designed to rev up my immune system to, to fight it. Those did not work. So in January of 2018, I had my left foot amputated, which was uh, certainly an interesting experience. I had, had two great doctors that were, I, I mean, they, they were like brothers. They, they were hilarious and, and they, they, they did an absolutely great job. And, and I was very fortunate to have them. They were able to save my ankle in, in the surgery. And so basically everything in front of my ankle was taken. And, um, you know, I was just like, well, let's, let's see what happens. And that, that lasted till 2019, when it just started to move up my leg. And uh, I had two surgeries in 19 to remove it from my shin. And then in 2020, last year, an undiagnosed tumor in my ankle grew large enough that it fractured my tibia, my shin bone. Um, and my only recourse during the pandemic was to have my left leg amputated above the knee. And I also found out at that time that I had tumors in my lungs. So it had, it had spread to my lungs. So on that uplifting story. Uh, <laughs> no, that, this, this, this conversation is important for a lot of reasons. And I think we'll get to that. So I want to know, as you've gone through this process, I, I have a philosophy that every experience is given to me for my, my opportunity to look at the, uh, the gift in that experience. So what have you learned, although it's not uplifting sounding, but what have been some of the gifts you've gotten out of going through this so far? I, I've really kind of developed over these last nine years what I call my four truths. And, and I, I sort of couple those with what I call the three Fs, with which, are, which are faith, family, and friends. And, you know, I don't think I could have gotten this far, you know, without my faith, certainly without my family. And, and you, when you have this kind of an illness, you, you really find out who your friends are, you know, who's yeah. going to stick by you during, during this kind of thing. But the, the four truths are, and, and I'll give them to you, I, I have them they're written on a post-it note. They're one sentence each. They're, they're just sitting here on my desk. And, and I kind of use those to make decisions in my life and, and, you know, what things I should get involved in, what, even what treatment I should do. So the first one is this, you need to control your mind or your mind will control you. The second one is you need to embrace the pain and discomfort that we all experience in life and use that pain and discomfort to make you a stronger and more determined individual. The third one is more of a legacy truth. 
and I've, I've kind of added this one, you know, within the last six months or so, and it's this, it's what we leave behind is what we weave in the hearts of other people. And then the fourth one is, is pretty self-explanatory. As long as you don't quit, you can never be defeated. So I use those truths to, to kind of plow my way through whatever comes up. I love it. I love those four truths. I want to touch on each of them for a second. Control your mind or it will control you. I am sure there have been days and maybe even weeks as you've gone through these past nine years that that was a felt like an almost insurmountable thing to be able to do. How have you managed to, as I call it, keep your ass in the saddle on that? When you're, you, you know, you're in pain and you're, you get, it's, it feels like more not good news after more not good news. And you're attempting to deal with being really sick as well. How do you, how have you managed to keep yourself out of the ditch on that? Yeah, I, I, I you, you bring up a really good point. And I, I guess I want your, your listeners to understand that, you know, I'm a human being. There's no S on my chest. I don't have a cape and fly around with magical powers. You know, I, I have bad days. Know. I cry. I get down. I get depressed. We're all going to have pain in our lives. And it doesn't have to be cancer pain like mine or a terminal illness or even a chronic illness. You know, I mean, you could flunk a test at school or break up with your boyfriend or your girlfriend or not get the promotion that you think you deserve at work. Pain is inevitable. Suffering, on the other hand, that's optional. That's what you do with that pain. You know, do, do you use it to make you stronger and tougher and more determined? Or do you wallow in it, you know, and feel sorry for yourself and want other people to feel sorry for you? Do I get into that point? Yes. From time to time, I do. I just don't let myself stay there because it's nothing good comes out of that. You're not, you're not going to move forward. You know, you're not going to do anything but just feel sorry for yourself. And the more sorry you feel for yourself, the less energy you have, the less energy you have, the harder it is to, to fight this thing. So I just use that pain to make me stronger. So I don't, I don't know if that answers your question, yeah, no, but I... It's great. That's that embracing the pain and suffering part. That was your number two one. And number three, you said, what you leave behind, you weave in the hearts of others. So far, what have you left in the hearts of others? You know, that's a great question. And, you know, as a coach, you know, especially when you're coaching basketball and things like that, you wonder, you know, do you ever have, are you having an impact on your players and things like that? And I always used to tell my players two, two main things. One, there's only two things that you can control during the game. And in all honesty, you can really control in life. And that's your attitude and your effort. Everything else is pretty much out of your control. You know, you get on the court, you're ready to have a good game. Referee has a bad game, calls a couple dumb fouls that aren't fouls, and now you're sitting on the bench. Now, you can sit there and brood about it and be down and depressed about it, or you can root for your teammates. So that, that was one thing that I always wanted them. I, I drilled that into them a lot. And the second thing was I wanted them to realize they needed to be comfortable with being uncomfortable because being uncomfortable is the only way you're going to grow. I mean, if you think about it, our brains are hardwired to avoid pain and discomfort and to seek pleasure. So to the brain, the status quo is good. It's like, as long as things are good, you're not messing, with, things are fine. But let's take an example of somebody who's looking for a new job. You know, you're in a dead end position and you want to move on. As soon as you do that, your brain is going to kick in and be like, whoa, wait, wait a minute, Andy, why, why do you want to do that? You know what? You get along great with the people here at the office and the work is easy and you're making good money. And you know what? You go somewhere else, you may not get along with those people over there. To, you, to the brain, anytime you step out of the status quo, it's scary. It's almost like a defense mechanism that, that's put in there. But here's the deal. The only way you're going to grow, the only way you're going to get better is if you do things that scare you. If you step outside of your comfort zones and I always tell young people, especially, if there's something in your heart, something in your soul that you believe you're supposed to do, but it scares you, go ahead and do it. Because at the end of your life, the things you're going to regret are not going to be the things you did. They're going to be the things that you didn't do. And by then, it's going to be too late to go back and do them. That is so true and such sage advice. I love that. And of course, I think the, the fourth one of your truths is pretty self-explanatory. As long as you don't quit, you'll never lose. And I am sure there have been 
days and even weeks where you felt like throwing the towel in. Oh, t totally. I, I, I mean, when I was on interferon, you know, it, for me, it was literally just about winning the day. You know, I, I just got to get through this day and, and, and think about that. You do that. You, you just got to get through today. And, and this is a five year road. And, and there were days when literally winning the day was was winning this five minutes. I feel so lousy. I mean, there there were I'll, I'll be honest with you. There were days that I prayed to die. I, I, I was just like, God, just take take this away. Take me out of this. I, I, I can't. I can't do this. I, I you know, I, I feel so lousy. I, I'm, I'm so sick of throwing up. I'm so sick of feeling achy and headachy and all that kind of stuff. You know, there were days where my wife would be like, look, just come to the table and sit with us. I know you don't feel good. You know, and, and I take a bite of mashed potatoes and immediately, you know, run to the sink and have to throw up and that. And it's, I, I always say, you know, it, th it's, that's not living. It's just not dying. And that's kind of how I felt. I, I wasn't living. I, I mean, I wasn't doing anything productive. Productive for me was if I could throw a load of laundry in the wash machine, you know, to kind of help my wife out or something like that. That was a good day. That was winning that five minutes and that kind of thing. But it, it wasn't living. It was just not dying. And I was kind of like, you know, you, you sort of have to weigh those, you know, I mean, are, are you really living your life or are you just kind of existing and getting through and, and you're pulling everybody along with you because it's not just you when, when this happens, you know, you're, you're, it's kind of like throwing the, the, the pebble in the pond, you know, the ripple effect that goes out, you're the one who's the, the pebble, you're the one who made the ripples, but boy, all these people are coming along with you. That is so true. And that's such a great point. And I hope our listeners really heard that because how you show up, is going to dictate a lot of times how they show up and it's human nature they they'll feel sad or they'll feel like they want to help you and those kinds of things but um, if you're having a bad day if they're not pretty strong and can rise above it they and they plug into it then that their day probably won't be as good as it could have been otherwise either but i would say that you were fairly productive while you were sick because you started your website motivational check and you also wrote a book and um, your book is called Sustainable Excellence. Tell us why you wrote the book. And I'm an author too. And you only took three and a half months to write your book. It took me <laughs> about 18 to, to write mine. So kudos to you because that's, uh, that's a big task. Why did you write the book? What inspired you to do it? And then I want to ask you a couple more questions about it. Sure. So the book is really born out of two conversations I had. One was with a former player that I coached in high school who had moved to Colorado where my wife and I live. And, and we had had dinner with her and her fiance. And I remember saying to her one night, you know, I'm, I'm really excited that you're living close and I can watch you find and live your purpose. And she got real quiet for a while and she kind of looked at me and she was like, well, coach, what do you think my purpose is? I said, I have no idea what your purpose is, but that's what your life should be about finding the reason you were put on the face of this earth. And then once you find that, re that reason, living it. So that was one conversation. And then I had a young man in college who reached out to me and he wanted to know what I thought were the most important things that he should learn to not only be successful in, in his job or in business, but in life in general. And I didn't want to give him the, you know, get up early, work hard, help others. Not that those aren't important. Those, those are incredibly important but I kind of felt they were done and I, 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 or had been done. And I wanted to give him something that, in all honesty, if I could, that resonated in his soul, so to speak. So I, I took some time and I wrote some notes and eventually I had these 10 ideas, these 10 principles, and I sent them to him. And then I kind of stepped back and I was like, well, you know, I got a life story that fits under this principle, or I know somebody whose life emulates that principle and so, as you mentioned, literally, I had my leg amputated in April of 2020, started chemotherapy in June of 2020 for the tumors in my lungs. And during that roughly three and a half month period where I was healing, I sat down at the computer every day and I started to build stories under each of these principles. And so I've got this book, you know, Sustainable Excellence, the 10 Principles to Leading Your Uncommon and Extraordinary Life. And I always say that I wrote the book, but in all honesty, to me, it was it was really kind of inspired by God. I, and, and I really believe that. I mean, I, I sort of joke that, you know, I think God said, just sit down here at the computer dummy and do what I tell you. And, you know, you're going to have a book and things are going to be good. 
and and I remember when the book was released, I was like, okay, I, I've never done this before. All right, I, I, I got to sell books. I got to sell books. I got to sell books. And I had a best-selling author over in the United Kingdom who I connected with on LinkedIn. And he kind of pulled me aside. And he's like, Terry, you're, you're totally missing the point here. Your job is not to sell books. Your job is to help people. If you help people, your books will sell themselves. And, and I was so glad he, you know, sort of slapped me in the face over that because I didn't write the book to make money. I didn't write the book to get famous. I didn't write the book to even get more speaking engagements. I wrote the book to help people. And, and you know, when, when you have an 87-year-old man who you have no idea who this guy is, buys your book, reads it, and then reaches out to you and says, if I would have had those principles when I was younger, I would have had a much better life. Kind of felt I was on to something once he did that. Yeah. And if, if it's only one person that the words on the pages of that book that you wrote improves their life in some way, shape, or form, it was worth it. And I'm sure there's been a lot more than just one person that have gained a lot of good knowledge and advice out of the effort you put into, inspired by God, it sounds like, to get that book written and published. Yeah, it really, you know, it's funny because the, the, the chapters, each chapter is a principle. And it, it, I, I get so much uh, enjoyment out of when people there's always one principle that resonates with the person who's reading it, you know, and, and they're, they're not in any order, you know, number one isn't any more important than number four, but it's, it's just interesting to me to see which ones people pick up on, you know, this, this is the one that really, you know, hit home for me and stuff like that. So, and it's always different. So it's, it's just great, you know, based on our experiences that different things resonate with us that way. And does one of the 10 resonate more with you than the others? Which, yeah, it does. And, and, and it's sure it, it's most people think with their fears and their insecurities instead of using their minds. And I know I've done that. You know, I've know I've said, oh, I'd like to do that, but mm, it kind of scares me. Or, you know, what are people going to say about me if I if I fail on that? And, and, you know, when you're young, that's important. When you're old like me, you don't care what people say anymore. You know, you, you get to a point where it's like, I don't care what people say. And and, and I, I do tell, especially young people, it's like, you know, what people think, what people say, that, the heck with that. Because at the end of your life, you're not going to be judged on what other people said or did. You're going to be judged on what you said and what you did. So forget about what other people are saying and, and just concentrate. And again, going back to what I said earlier, if there's something in your heart, something in your soul that you feel you're supposed to do, go ahead and do that. I agree wholeheartedly. Do you have any fears? Do I have any fears? I mean, my fears are more about letting people down than I, I, I mean, I, I've, you know, as a policeman, I've faced a lot of, of things, you know, I, you used to always get, you know, are you ever scared as a policeman? Like any, any cop who tells you they're not scared from time to time is either an idiot or they're lying to you, yeah. you know? And I, I mean, I can remember simple runs, you know, you, you get sent on a noise run. Somebody wants their neighbor to turn their stereo down. And, you know, I had a partner and, you know, sometimes it would be like, ooh, you know, I, I, you just get a feeling, you know, I have a bad feeling about this run. And, you know, a lot of cops would be like, ah, you know, eh, it's just a noise run. You know, we were always very much, if you've got a bad feeling, then we're going to be extra careful. We're going to be extra cautious in, in doing this. And so, you know, I think you need to respect fear. Fear is a, is a gift, I think, that, you know, that we all have. But I, but I think also if you spend too much time in fear, you're going to paralyze yourself and you're never going to get anything done. I wonder if, if there is some distinction between fear and just having a really solid gut feeling about something. Because it sounds like when you went on some of those calls, as simplistic as they might have sounded to the lay person, you had a gut feeling about mm, something just doesn't feel right about this situation we're getting ready to step into. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there was a when I was in the drug unit, uh, and, and we. It's interesting how you find things out, you know, years later when you you arrest people. I always said law enforcement was a lot like business in terms of the eighty twenty rule. You know, eighty percent of your business came from twenty percent of your customers. Well, law enforcement, it was the same way. Eighty percent of the crime came from twenty percent of the criminals, and and a lot of times you knew who they were. But when when one of the guys I worked with was. Uh, a beat officer, you know, was in a uniform in a marked car, you know, answering radio runs. He went to uh, this apartment 
And he knocked on the door and told them, you know, hey, we got a complaint. You need to turn it down. And they did. They turned the, the music down and, and, and he left. Well, we arrested one of the people in, the, in that apartment uh, about six years later. And they told him that if he would have walked into that apartment, there was a guy behind the door with an AK-47 that would have killed him. Wow. So, you know, sometimes you're like, yeah, there but for the grace of God, you know. No kidding. So, yeah. boy, yeah. Um, and thank you for your service as a public servant, because you guys have very challenging jobs. And I don't think enough people understand that. And thank you enough. So I thank you on behalf of all of us. We appreciate you, it. You said that you wrote the book because of this conversation with one of your past uh, players, your basketball players, and it was about finding your purpose. So what is your purpose? I think my purpose is different now than it was. Um, you know, if, if I go back, if you, if you sort of look at my resume, you know, my first two jobs out of college were in business. But my, my passion, my purpose, my why, whatever you want to call it, I always felt was law enforcement. My, my grandfather on my dad's side was a Chicago police officer from 1924 to 1954, and you know, was in Chicago during the height of prohibition where alcohol was illegal in the US during the Great Depression in the 30s. And, you know, and during the gangs that were shooting up the town, you know, Al Capone and things like that. And I didn't really know him. He died when I was like seven years old, but his wife, my grandmother lived until I was in college. So I got to hear a lot of the stories and I felt that was my, my passion. And my dad, my grandfather was actually shot in the line of duty with his own gun. Wasn't a serious injury, he was shot in the ankle. But my dad always remembered the stories my grandmother told about the knock on the door of, you know, Mrs. Tucker, grab your son, your husband's been shot and come with us. So my dad was having nothing to do with me being in law enforcement. You know, he, he literally had my whole life planned out. You know, you're gonna go to college, you're gonna major in business, you're gonna get out, you're gonna get a good job, get married, have 2.4 kids and live in the suburbs and live happily ever after. Unfortunately, that was what my dad wanted me to do. That wasn't my purpose. And so I had a decision to make after college. He was sick. He was dying of cancer. And I knew he didn't want me to do that. So my first two jobs were in business, more out of respect for him. Um, and I, you know, I sort of joke, I did what every good son did. I waited till my father died. And then I followed my dreams, my passion. And I became a policeman when I was 37 years old, which by most accounts, is, is pretty old to become a rookie policeman. Yes. So that was my passion then. I think my passion now, in all honesty, is with whatever time I have left to put as much goodness, as much positivity, positivity, as much love, as much peace back into the world as I possibly can. Well, in all the investigation research I've done uh, uh, on what you've been up to, that's exactly what you're doing. So you're right on purpose, it seems to me. I want to talk so. about... Um, and then we'll swing back around to uh, this conversation around grief and some of the things that you and I talked about a month or so ago. Given your experience over the last nine years, I'm curious because my mom was a nurse and I'm in the healthcare business. We have a physical therapy and wellness clinic. I, I say, and this is just me, I say we don't have a healthcare system in this country. We have a disease management system. I would be interested to, see, to know from you as a person who's been in this system, whichever we wanna call it, for the past nine years and prior with just being normal checkups and whatnot, where is it broken? And what can we do to kind of write the course a little bit? So do you have about five hours? <laughs> <laughs> I know that's a big um, question. Yeah, it, it, it really is. And I, I think a couple things that I have experienced, certainly on, on the insurance side, you know, there seems to be a, you know, kind of willy nilly, uh, we'll cover this today, but next week, we won't cover that. And there's really no reason why it's, you know, they give you the classic, you know, it's not medically necessary. Yep. Well, you're sitting in an office, you know, eight states away from me, having never seen me, never understanding what I'm going through. And my doctor is saying it is medically necessary. And there's really no arbitration. You can have a peer to peer and, you know, try to talk it out. And that, that has worked once in, in all my times. I mean, 
I, I think I alluded earlier, I used to get a PET scan every six months when I was on the interferon and things like that. When this tumor in my ankle grew large enough that it, it basically broke my leg, I was due for a PET scan. Insurance company denied it. Said, no, we don't think it's medically necessary. If they had done it, they would have found that tumor. I very well may have not have lost my leg. But, you know, that's water under the bridge. There's nothing I can do about it. So that's that's one part of it. The insurance thing is massively broken. Yes. And secondly, I don't think I don't think doctors understand what patients go through. And if I could do anything, I would make doctors, you know, flip around and, and, and spend some time in a patient's shoes, because unless you're an advocate for yourself, um, or you have somebody in healthcare, whether it's your general practice physician, you know, I have a cardiologist and an oncologist that are literally one floor apart from each other who have never met each other, mm. you know, and, and I'm like, really, you, you referred me to my cardiologist and yet you've never met her. And now granted her expertise is cardiology with a cancer emphasis, but a lot of times the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. And when I, when I started to have, uh, when, I, when I got away from PET scans and started to have CAT scans, which are actually more beneficial to see my tumors, um, now I just lost my train of thought, um, that, you know, that, that was something that um, my cardiologist or my oncologist was like, all I care about in that CAT scan is melanoma. Is, is there melanoma somewhere else in your body? Now, I started reading my CAT scans after I ended up having my, have my gallbladder removed because I had gall, a tremendous amount of gallstones. And I went back and read the CAT scans. All through it, it said, you know, gallstones, of, you know, here, you know, your prostate's enlarged. But as long as it doesn't say melanoma, nobody's going to tell me that I've got gallstones or that my prostate is enlarged or, you know, whatever. It's just not germane to what they're doing. So you kind of need somebody who, I guess, you know, sort of rides roughshod over the whole process. And most people don't have that. And most people aren't smart enough or savvy enough to really be responsible for their own medical care. Yeah, I find that a lot too. And I think that is such great advice for any of you listening that are in a, find yourself in a situation or you may in the future find yourself in a situation where you're in this system and it is a system. And I found this out being in business, being in lawsuits, one has to drive their own bus when it comes to that because your attorneys in my case were interested in one thing getting paid. Whether they won the case or not, they were going to get paid. And in the healthcare system, your cardiologist is interested in one thing, whether you have melanoma showing up or your oncologist, cardiac oncologist, or uh, whoever's doing your extra CAT scans. And they're not looking beyond the borders of that. So good for you that you took the bull by the horns and started reading all this information because that's what we have to do. We really have to inform ourselves about what's going on with our own body so we can be our own advocate. And it may take some time and it may be confusing a little bit, but it's certainly possible. And so I'm glad you brought that up because I think that's a very important point to... And, and, and don't be afraid to ask questions. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I have seen people that have literally turned their care, all of their care over to their doctor. I'm not asking any questions. I, I, I don't, I don't want to know. You just tell me what I should do and I'll go do it. And, and I'm not like that. I want to know why, why, why are we doing this? Why, why aren't we doing that? Or what do you expect to see out of this? And when do you expect to see it? And, and I, have a, I have a really good oncologist, a very cerebral guy, very intelligent guy. And, and he's not a hypothetical. He's not going to sit here and say, if I asked him today, how long do you think I have? I have no idea. You know, that, that's exactly what he's, I have no idea. And, and you're right. They don't. My dad lived three and a half years after being told to go home and die. And I believe the reason he did was because he had a purpose. He hmm. went to work up to two weeks before he died. Now, let me back that up and say, I'm not saying your purpose has to be your job. It doesn't. I mean, you, you could have a job to pay the bills, but your purpose is, you know, to write or, you know, whatever it is. But for him, 
his job was his purpose. Yes. And I think if he hadn't had that purpose, if I wasn't able to do the things I'm doing now in between my therapies, like podcasts and writing and things like that, I'd probably be dead by now. I'm sure my dad would have been de dead by now. But that's one thing the doctors don't know. They don't know your mind. You know, they don't know your spirit. They don't know your daughter's getting married next year. And you know what? You want to be there for that. So yeah, you tell me I got two months to live. No, I'm going to hang around until my daughter's married. That, that happens. I've seen that all the time. So don't, don't take a number that some doctor says who doesn't know you and said, you know, oh, the doctor says I got three months. That's all I got. Mm, maybe that's not the case. I agree with that. I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. And that takes me to kind of the next direction I want to go with you before we end our conversation today. And that is we are all going to die. So far, at least to my knowledge, human beings don't get out of this game without dying. <laughs> so I, I think, and we never know. We never know. And it could be in traffic. It could be something unexpected. I just had a friend who lost a dear friend the other day, played golf with him in the morning. The guy went to yoga that afternoon, died of a heart attack two, two evenings ago. Never know. In your case, you have this thing called cancer doesn't mean it's a death sentence. It just means you have this thing called cancer. You get to decide what that means to you. However, I would like to, to get your input on the conversation, especially in our culture, that we seem to have around death. It's almost a taboo thing to have a conversation about. It's back in the day, even 50 or 60 years ago, if there was somebody died, they were in the home for a while. Everybody saw them and everybody was part of that event. And now it's almost like we want to sterilize, take that person off to a room where it's all white walls and there's a lot of latex gloves and there's a lot of latex tubes and we're not going to talk about it. And um, you have gone so far as, and you shared this with me in our conversation a month ago or so, that you've planned your own funeral, which I think is a great idea for all of us, regardless of what medical condition we do or don't have, because it gives you the opportunity. If you're going to throw a party for yourself, a celebration of life, you might as well make it like you want it. And it might as well be kick-ass, right? So you've gone through that process. I would be interested in some of your thoughts about the conversation we have in this country around death and to change our perspective on it, the, taking the morbidity out of it and putting some even humor into it. Because for me, the way I look at it is death is really a rebirth. Who knows what's on the other side of this? And this, this is pretty good for most people. But on the other side of this, I think it's the e-ticket. So what do you think about any of that? I, I totally agree with you. You know, it, it's funny when I, when I did go and plan my funeral, I, I, I got some pushback for some people like, you know, don't, don't you think that's kind of defeatist or kind of negative? And, you know, I kind of looked at them like, well, last time I checked, we're all going to die. I don't think anybody's <laughs> working on a cure for life right now, but, you know, and I, th I think that goes back to though, you know, what we were talking about, about finding your purpose. Everybody dies but not everybody really lives. Right. And I remember years ago, I heard a Native American Blackfoot proverb that I love. And, and it goes like this. It said, when you were born, you cried and the world rejoiced. Live your life in such a way so that when you die, the world cries and you rejoice. rejoice. That's what I want a lot. Life or death doesn't scare me as much. And it really doesn't scare me at all at this point. I mean, don't get me wrong. I don't want to die. I'm not going to hasten that process by any means. But it doesn't scare me. And the reason it doesn't is because I've lived my purpose. And, and I'm going to make a huge, huge generalization here. But I've seen a lot of people die as a policeman. And I've also seen a lot of people die during my nine-year cancer journey. And the people that I have seen die what you and I probably would say, you know, are, are peaceful or, or happy deaths are the people that actually found the reason they were supposed to be here and live that reason. And yet the people who go kicking and screaming, you know, who want another week or another month or another year, those seem to be, again, huge generalization, the people who never did anything with their life. They never tried to find their purpose and, and, and live it. So for me, I'm like you, you know, it's kind of like, all right, I lived this life. I did what I was supposed to do. Now let's, you know, I, I always kind of acquaint it back to the old Star Trek, you know, movies where, you know, Kirk is sitting there and Sulu's at the console. And it's like, you know, where are we going, Captain? 
and you know, and Kirk was kind of like out there. We're going <laughs> out there. And that's kind of what I want to do. I want to go out there and see what's out there. Because like you and having had a strong faith or having a strong faith, I kind of believe that what what's out there is so much better than what's here. And I think this is pretty good. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. I uh, shared with you before we started the podcast today that I've been doing a lot of lists. I listen to a lot of podcasts myself, but I've been listening to a lot of podcasts by this doctor. His name's Zach Bush. He's a, a triple board certified physician. He has endocrinology, he's internal medicine, and his most recent uh, uh, licensure was as palliative care and hospice. But when he was in the hospital and taking care of patients in the hospital, and on call, they would have code calls. And the first thing you do if you're the doctor on duty is you go with your team to this person that's having a, generally it's a heart attack and they do everything they can to save them. The, the injections, the CPR, the paddles, whatever they is appropriate in, the, in those particular cases. And he said in his time in the hospital, that happened three times. And these three people that, um, he actually brought back to life. Uh, it happened more than those three times, but he experienced bringing people back three times. And he said they could have not been any more unlike one another than you can imagine. He said, but once we got to the point where we brought them back and the dust had settled from that, he said, they all asked me the same question and they all said the exact same thing when they were telling their family members or friends about this experience. And he said, the question they asked me was, why did you bring me back? And the story they related to their loved ones about that the experience was, it was so beautiful. It was the first time in my life that I felt 100% accepted. And so yeah, I think... I yeah, you ahead. know, if you, if you go on YouTube, th there are hundreds of videos of people that, and you're right, all races, uh, you know, all ethnicities, all sexes that basically have the same very peaceful, very loving, very giving story. And yeah, I, I mean, I, I've watched a bunch of those. And, you know, like, if you look at those, like, why are you afraid? What are you afraid of? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I would like to know, because I think it would be useful for our listeners, what are some of the things you've done to be so accepting and keep that fear cast to the side so it doesn't get in your way to living your purpose each day? What's helped you through that? I, I, I spend at least an hour every day um, in prayer. Um, certainly, I pray for myself. I pray that this, you know, this drug will will cure me. It, 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 you know, more than likely won't, but miracles happen every single day. And I pray for, you know, like I said, I've met so many people <clears throat> over the years that, that I still, some are doing well, some are not doing well. I, I just lost, there were seven of us that started on this clinical trial drug and there were, we were down to two of us. And the, this woman who I just saw a couple of weeks ago, literally the cancer came back in her spine. She had a quick surgery was going to um, have some radiation, went into the hospital last weekend and died on Thursday. Mm -hmm. And, you know, out of the blue and, and nobody expected it. She wasn't that sick. And so you're right. You never know. I mean, you, you go to a yoga class and you drop dead of a heart attack. You, you just never know. It's not the death that, that you need to worry about. It's the living. It's right. what are you doing with your life? It's what do you, you know, how are you living your purpose? How are you finding that purpose? I remember talking that conversation with my player kind of went on you know it was a little more in depth and one of the things I told her I said you know because she was like well what if what if I don't have enough time what if there's not enough time to find my purpose and and I, I told her a couple of things I said one I don't believe a god that would put you on this earth to to have a purpose to do something would say okay I'm going to put you here and you know hey next week you're going to find your purpose but haha -ha, I'm going to take you away you know, I, I, God's not going to do that so you're going to have plenty of time as long as you keep looking. And the, and the story I told her was about Colonel Sanders, you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken, who started that restaurant, that franchise, when he was in his 60s. He started yeah. it after he retired. And can you imagine if he went, I don't know if that was his purpose in life, I'm going to assume it was, 
But what if in his 40s, he would have just thrown his hands up and said, ah, you know what, I'm done. I'm not looking. I'm just going to stay where I am. I'm happy. I'm content. You know, and it's kind of the old Shawshank redemption quote of, you know, get busy living or get busy dying. Yes. And, you know, if you're not living, if you're not growing, if you're not moving forward, then you're dying. And, and I want to, you know, I, I read a lot. I do. I, I want to die learning. And I want my last thought to be something new that I didn't know about. I, I, I don't know why, but I, I just feel that that's, that's what I'm supposed to do. And that, so I, I just, I just think people need to get on with their lives and, and don't worry about the death. Spend more time worrying about finding your purpose in life. And when you find that, live it and live it with everything you've got. And I'm telling you right now, one of the th questions my player asked me is like, well, how will I know if it's my purpose? I'm like, well, if you get up in the morning and you can't wait to go do whatever it is you think your purpose is, yep. it's probably your purpose. But, you know, and, and the reverse is true. You know, if you get up like, oh, I got to go do this. Yeah, that's probably not your purpose. So true. Such, such brilliant advice. I really agree with that so wholeheartedly. Folks can get your book on your website, which I'll put in the show notes. They can learn about if they're interested in having a motivational speaker. You have that on your website as well. Uh, do we have another book in the works? Writing another one? You know, I, I, maybe. Yeah, you know, I, I, I like the book that I wrote, but I think it's, it's definitely a book about success. You know, whether, you know, you're, you're successful, you know, in PT or podcasting or whatever you do, or I'm successful in whatever I do. It's about success. I think I'd like my next book to be about another word that begins with S, and that's significance. Yeah. You know, success is what we do for ourselves. Significance is what we do for other people. Now, I think you can be both. I think you can be successful and significant, but I think I'd like my next book to be more about doing for others and less about doing for myself. Brilliant. I like that a lot. I would like to, if you wouldn't mind leading this, to, since prayer is such a big part of your, your day and how you've managed through the last several years, would you mind leading us through what you told me when we talked last time is your favorite prayer, and that's called the Our Father. Would you do that with us? I'd be more than happy to. Okay, let's do it. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Yeah. So good. Thank you for doing that. I, as you Thank know, you. I collect rosaries and I pray because I believe in God and I, I believe that this, I, I say he, but this divine intelligence that I'm part of really has put this plan in place for me and this plan in place for you and all of our listeners. My job is to get still enough and quiet enough to see and hear the wisdom that's being sent to me constantly. If I can just quiet myself long enough to see the signs or hear the, the conversations that somehow start to fall into place. And the way I look at it, as I'm sure you do too, Terry, all the things that God puts in my life, my house burned to the ground. I had a relationship that went up in flames. I was in a really complex lawsuit. My dad died all at the exact same time. And the thing that helped me most get through that was my faith and my trust that every single one of those challenging events were put into my life for a reason versus being victim yeah. to them or, you know, same, same with the things you've gone through in your whole life. And particularly in the last nine years, they're there for a reason. And I think the, the beauty of what's happened with you is you've transitioned from this, you had this passion to be in, in um, law enforcement and police officer to now you really are serving, not that you weren't serving people then, but you're serving people in ways you probably never thought you would have if it wasn't for this particular deck of cards or the hand of cards you were dealt. Yeah, I, one of the, you just reminded me of a story that one of the stories I put in the book was about, you know, Ezekiel, uh, it, it's from the Bible. Don't ask me chapter and verse because I, I will not get that right. You know, it, it, Ezekiel, who who is, you know, trying to commune with God and 
you know, there, there's a there's an earthquake, there, there's a storm, there's, you know, all these big, powerful things. And, you know, it's like, you know, God's voice was not in the storm. God's voice was not in the earthquake. God's voice was in that small little, you know, almost whisper that, like you say, if you can quiet yourself enough to be quiet, God will talk. I mean, there's an old joke about, you know, when we talk to God, it's called prayer. When God talks to us, it's called schizophrenia. So I, I'm not going to say God's ever talked to me, but but God will find a way to communicate with you. But it's not going to be in the jumble of all the things that are going on in our lives. It's going to be when we center ourselves and we get quiet and then we'll hear what we're supposed to do. Yeah, so true. That reminds me of another cute story that I heard. They were, you know, they were talking about, well, where should we put God in all of his wisdom and where, where the people won't, will never find them. And somebody said, well, let's put them on the moon. And they said, no, people are pretty industrious. They're pretty smart. They'll figure out how to build rockets and get to the moon. Another person suggested, wow, maybe we'll put them on the top of the highest mountain. And someone says, no, they're pretty industrious. These folks are smart. They'll figure out how to get to the top of the mountain. And someone else said, I know where we can put them that they'll never find him. And they said, where? And they said, inside themselves. And that's why we have to get so quiet so we can get to that, you know, blessed part inside of ourselves where all the wisdom lies and all our answers lie. If we, if we allow ourselves to, to, and it's not comfortable. Like you said, you have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. It's not a comfortable journey to take, but it's certainly one worthwhile. It, it is, you know, but that's the problem I think with most people. They're they're looking for God out there. God's already here. Yeah, right here. Carry around find him. Him. He's always with us, right here. Yeah, it, it's I mean, and and he wants so much to have a relationship with us, and yet we're so you know going ninety miles an hour, and we just oh not now you know I got to do this, I got to take the kids, I got to go to practice, I got to you know no just calm down for a few minutes and take some time, listen to that voice. I agree. Such good wisdom. Thank you so much. I've been really enjoyed this conversation today. And like I said, for our listeners, I will put the links to your website and how they can get a hold of your book, as well as the other resources you have on your website. And uh, let's stay in touch and God bless you. Thank you, Annie. I appreciate it. Take care. <laughs>